Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marche, the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guest and get started, I do need to do a little bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting, are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. Well, we are thrilled to bring you today's educational event. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box and the presenter will answer those queries during the question and answer portion at the end of the presentation today. If you have a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. And if we can't, uh, if we can't address your question during the event, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. Once again, we want this experience to be as educational as possible. So please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today and I wanna thank uh, JR for coming back. JR Gary is a certified financial planning practitioner that utilizes a unique approach and methodology called financial life planning. Life planning connects the dots between our financial realities and the lives we long to live. This method is based on the premise that advisors should first discover a client's most essential goals in life before formulating a financial plan. So a client's finances fully support those goals. As a lifelong learner, musician, and athlete, JR holds a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, trains Muay Thai, and has been playing the guitar for over 30 years. He actively performs and writes music in his band. And we're so excited to have you back, JR. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, today's topic is gonna be how to really choose the, the financial professional that you need most in your life and, and, and how to like really think about these things when you interview, which it is an interview process, um, the different professionals you're gonna meet. There's thousands of us out there, maybe hundreds of thousands, if I'm not mistaken, that do this kind of work. And it is, everybody has a different way of approaching it. The professional, I mean. So the interview process is, is this, we're gonna talk a lot about how to do the interview process. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to first go and say that the industry somehow really confused all of us in what we in financial planning or financial professionals. So financial professional is the top uh, most broad uh, definition, and then it sort of funnels down and the most common one we hear is financial advisor. Right. And that does kind of mean something. Uh, we, we use the words financial planner. We use the words wealth manager. Um, so they all have a different meaning and purpose, but there's no like, there's actually no really strict rule on this um, unless, uh, you know, unless something has come out in, in law that I'm not aware of, but we use these terms interchangeably. So financial professional could be anyone from an insurance agent to a wealth, to someone that helps people with their investments to someone giving them a well-rounded financial plan. The word financial planner tends to lean toward the person who does an actually well thought out planning process, typically referred to by the certified financial planner designations, which we'll get to in a second. And then uh, a wealth manager tends to be somebody who 
you know, we said we, we tend to use that word when we talk about people with like large sums of wealth. We use that word wealth wealth manager a lot. Then we have estate planners, we have CPAs or accountants. And so the list goes on and on. Most professionals, um, almost all of them, have some sort of licensing that they've done. So licensing is some sort of state or government ran institution will require us to take courses, study, and pass an exam showing uh, that we are capable of understanding basic um, information in these things. Um, they uh, some of the tests are rather complicated, and some of them are well, like a breeze. Uh, many licensing uh, requires us to do what we call continuing education. So we have to constantly like be updated on what's going on in the world. And they force us in order to keep those licenses and designations, they force us to continue to learn and learn and learn, which is a good thing. Which leads us to the next thing that says common designations. So a designation is sort of like, a, like one specific skill in this big world of finance, of finance. And you take a course, usually by some sort of university or institution, um, and they, it's like going back to college, right? You're in a classroom, you study, you learn, 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 study, 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 take an exam at the end, and now you are considered an expert in that field, right? That, I mean, experience helps a lot too. Um, I'll tell you, I have a lot of designations and they give you great information, but experience really is uh, one of the most powerful educators of them all. So we wanna just take a second and Marche is going to show us some uh, a list of designations. This is somewhere you can go. Now, what you will find is um, there are hundreds of them. So that's a lot. And um, I, I think that one of the a designation, in my opinion, shows a professional that really cares about their the things that they care about their business. They care about being knowledgeable, and they care because it, it, you don't get paid for this, right? You just do it because you have a, 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 an interest, something specific about it, and that's a good thing. So you wanna see designations. That doesn't mean I don't know professionals that are fantastic at this work who don't have any designation. You do learn the things on the job. It's just that you know there are people who are academics in this world and some people aren't, and that's it's okay, uh, but typically, um, if someone who's gotten a designation really cares about what they're doing and really, okay, so common ones. To me, the, the, num the pinnacle one is the CFP, Certified Financial Planner. It's intense. It, it, you can't get it done quickly. I mean, it could take years to complete. Uh, very rigorous testing. And it really breaks down financial um, concepts into categories, which all sum up to your personal financial plan and strategy, right? So they talk about goal planning, uh, understanding a person's financial picture, where they are. Uh, they teach you about insurance planning. They teach you about investment planning. They teach you about tax planning, estate planning. Uh, so it really goes into depth on all those different areas. Now, inside of those, you get all these different designations in each one of those areas that I just referred to. Like the CLU is great for people who sell insurance. It's a life insurance one. Um, the, there's one called an RICP, that's Retirement Income Certified Professional, it's spe specifically geared towards retirement. Chartered Financial Consultant is the CFP um, that you don't have to take the big CFP test. It's almost the same identical platform with like another extra class. Um, trying to think what else is there. Accredited Estate Planner, AEP, so somebody really is good at like the estate planning world. Um, trying to think, yeah, there's so many. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say what what I like about this is that you can, you know, actually go to one of these designations and find out exactly. Well, if you look at the top there, if you go to the top, just scroll mm -hmm. to the top for me, back where yeah. you were, it tells you how many there are in each category. So look. Yeah. One, 25, seven, 126 in the C. <laughs> so there's definitely over 100. Um, yeah, there's investment professionals, there's 401k professionals, like they just go really deep into everyone and just, and um, you know, you would just, you, when you look at you, when you interview your financial professional, take a look at what they've done, ask them about it and see how passionate they are when they, when you ask them the question about, you know, the designation. 
Um, so legal obligations, this is interesting. So the legal obligation a financial professional has with you is the one in which that you sign with them, right? So that's important. Um, there's different ways of looking at this. So one obligation would to be give you great sound advice, put a plan together and help you help identify the things that you need to do to be successful financially. That would be like the planning obligation, right? Put together a plan for me. Uh, another obligation would be to like an investment manager. Their job is to give you investment advice, but they're not they're not obligated to make you large sums of money in a short period of time, right? You need to be aware of that. You, they need to also let you know that you could lose money and they can't guarantee that you're going to make or lose money in any of these situations. An obligation might be that they have to, at minimum, meet with you on an annual basis to review it. They might be in an obligation with you to never, ever have to meet with you, right? So there's all these different um, ways of looking at it. And so, um, yeah, these, there's contracts and you sign them and you want to know what's in them and it's good to read them. I mean, most of the, the, um, most of the contracts you sign with a financial professional, you read the first five minutes of it and you're going to be falling asleep. But uh, generally speaking, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of data in there. And I've, I've gone line by line with all my contracts with people and you should too. I mean, that's really important. Um, yes, so if a securities licensed uh, advisor, so someone who gives advice on the buying and selling of securities or management or advisory of securities does something bad, um, like with intent to do something bad, there is a way to make a complaint to the SEC and FINRA. FINRA is that same thing that you, you put up before. That was where uh, Marche went with the, uh, the website and they can complain. Or you could do it right with their own company. You can call their, 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 their boss or call the company. There's a, a lot of places that make a complaint. Now, what's important about this is complaints are recorded. And so then you can go to a website called Broker Check and meet or, or read about your particular financial professional that you just that you want to interview and that's it right there on the screen you type in their name and you'll see what's going on in their history if anyone's made a complaint and uh you know like you got to be the thing is is this is information for you to make decisions and if you like a person and they have a complaint that doesn't mean they're a bad person you just got to ask them about it what happened uh can you talk about it um, you know, somebody did something 20 years ago that was just like a mistake and it was like a rookie mistake. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. It happens, right? And so you ask them about it. That doesn't mean they're a bad person, but there are bad people, right? And if you start to see this like repetitive nature of complaints and they keep getting hired by these institutions, you know, maybe that's not the best person to hire, right? So that's obvious. All right. What value does a financial planner bring to the table? So. Um, so notice the word in the title, a financial planner. <clears throat> so to me, let's just kind of, let's make a definition of planner for a second. So a planner is not somebody typically steering you in a direction of one financial tool or product. A planner does what it says in the title. They, in order to create any plan for anything we do in life, we need to set goals. So it's a person that's going to help you establish what your goals are. Then through knowledge and education, they teach you about what's available to you in the marketplace in order to achieve said goal and then execute a strategy to achieve the goal. Okay, so that's what a planner does. <clears throat> so a planner tends to see the whole picture, right? I know that you want to achieve uh, what are the common things most people want? Right? We want to retire one day. We want to uh, support our families financially. We want to maybe send our loved ones to universities. We want to travel, right? Vacation. We want to um, buy a home. These are the big picture goals. And then maybe we even want to start a business. Maybe it's, there's a dream inside of us, all kinds of wonderful things. That's the big picture. And then and they can objectively tell you what to do to be successful. Now, it's not, remember, a financial planner is not pointing the finger at you, say, do this, do this, do this. It's giving you the knowledge and education you need to make 
your own informed decisions and have a sort of like a guide or a coach there along the way with you, helping you navigate the decisions you're going to make. Um, so this is really important, the, the projection concept. So most people who don't deal in the world of money don't look out into the beyond and into the future. Right? It's, our lives are so in the present, and that's where we want to be is in the present most of the time. But there's a lot of knowledge and power in seeing what will happen to myself and my wealth and my money into the future in one simulator. Right? If I keep doing what I'm, gonna, I'm doing, what will the outcome be as opposed to something else? What will happen if I did something different? Let's simulate that. That's the concept of a projection. I'm going to project my future. Now, the future will never become exactly the way the software or the advisor told you it will be. Let's be honest. Immediately as we move on, the, the thought process was false because that's just life in general. But it's really, not, there's a lot of knowledge and education that can be downloaded into our brains when we can say, oh, if I do that, this is what the outcome will be. Um, I think a financial planner helps you avoid mistakes. In the world of money, mistakes are not fun. You either lose it, which is not fun, or you miss out on it. Money, a lot of times people are missing out on money and they don't realize it. Like I call that, another way of saying is opportunity. Uh, a great financial professional can, can connect you to a network of other financial professionals. You, everybody's going to need other professionals in their lives. It's just the way the system works. If I have a complicated tax situation, I'll need a CPA. If I want to buy real estate, I need a real estate agent. Then I'm going to need a mortgage person to fund that transaction. Then I'm going to need insurance agents to insure the house, insure me, insure my family. And then I'm going to need a lawyer to put together the contract, set up my wills and trusts. And so there's this network of people, all right? And so you can do all the work yourself and find these professionals. They're everywhere. Or your professional can give you some people that like they've worked with in the past and that they trust and they don't know do anything wrong. So that's really helpful. And they manage those people for you. See, in the world of money, this is important. There's a lot of noise in the world of money. And when a person in a very specific industry gives you advice, they typically only give you advice from their perspective. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you just want to make sure that you understand it. And so your planner can kind of filter out the noise for you. That's really helpful. And then lastly, I love the concept of motivation and accountability. This is, this is where I live. When someone's holding you accountable to achieve the things you said that you want to achieve, the probability of you achieving that said goal just rises really quickly. I mean, yeah, so there are people who are mo motivated by themselves to do things, but we all know that we, you know, let's talk about, I mean, like we all know that uh, if someone's there just pointing, like kind of like encouraging us, there's a higher probability of us achieving. So that is that. Thank you. Let's move to the next one. Okay, another important conversation. So I, I promise you, I didn't make this up. The industry did this and they made it super complicated. So let me try to clear this up. There, in my personal experience, let's break down how they get paid into three basic ways. Now I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start backwards on this. I'm gonna start with fee only. Okay, so a fee only plan or financial professional says this, this is easy. I am going to write a check to you, Mr. or Mrs. Financial Professional, and you in return are going to give me advice. And I'm gonna pay you based on the amount of time I spent, uh, you're going to get paid based on the amount of time you spend with me and the amount of information and how complex my finances are. Now, the way in which they will determine the fee is probably as it says there, hourly. They could put you on a subscription like Netflix, right? So Netflix for finance, right? Once a month, money comes out and that you get to utilize them for as much time as that subscription allows for, let's say it's monthly or, okay. Um, so that's the general way they do it. You, it could be on retainer. It could be based on an annual basis. It's all about the complexity going on in your financial plan, how much time they're gonna put in. Now, for that, they're gonna help you with software, powerful software that you're gonna utilize to help you make projections. They're gonna do 
um, advice giving, education. They're going to put your plan together. They're going to uh, help you fulfill on the plan. And like put, when I say help you, that means sort of like introduce you to the right people that are going to do the right things for you or, you know, the other professionals you need, uh, help you, you know, they're going to give you investment advice. They're going to, they're going to help you determine what your risk is. A lot of things go into that. But that necessarily, they're not going to do the things you want them that like, let me, so let's move on to the next one and then I'll clear this up. So the next way is fee-based. Now, I tend to think associate fee-based with the concept of fees for assets under management. Okay, so this is different. Quite often in my business, people, financial professionals will manage the investment strategy for a family. The reason is, is a person can manage their investments themselves. That is real. And it's, I mean, there's a lot of websites you can download for free to do that stuff and do it on your own. But people just don't have the time. They're busy, they have work, they have families. So they want someone in, in my world to manage their investments for them, okay? And over time, if done appropriately, these accounts tend to grow over time. So that makes people happy and they love their financial professional for that. Well, that account will pull a fee from it associated with the amount of money that's in the account. For instance, very common, you will hear, you, the financial professional gets 1% times the amount of assets they manage. So round numbers, if I have $100,000 times 1%, that's $1,000 per year will come out of the account and go into the financial professional's company. That's how that, what that means. And for that fee from there, you should get some services. The investment management, maybe give you some financial planning advice, maybe you know, connect you to the right people, but not the same business relationship as choice number one, which is the fee only. Maybe they do both, maybe it's a combination, maybe not. But that's where the contract gets really important. You know, is it just for the management of assets or is it a combination of both assets and the planning? Lastly, is the commission. So financial professionals, if licensed, will get compensated by connecting you to a business that sells financial products. Insurance is the easiest one to explain because everyone gets this. You know, let's just say you need life insurance. You had a, you had a child or, um, you know, there's a reason to get life and you want to be charitable. You want to give your, a charity um, uh, your life insurance policy when you pass. There's all kinds of reasons for life insurance. When you do it, it's real simple. You send a check every month to the insurance company, call it 20 bucks a month. Well, somebody gets compensated, the financial professional, for connecting the two of you. That's a commission, okay? So the key about all of these different ways to get, comp now, now in the process of that finance, of the insurance relationship, right? For getting paid for connecting for insurance, they may give you ancillary financial advice in other areas too. The key to all of this, is that the professional tells you how they get compensated in a clear uh, way. And then if they get paid, they can get paid again in a different format if you love working with that just one person. So if they do, they are now, if they get paid in multiple ways, there's a, what we call a conflict of interest. Meaning that if they get compensated for one kind of work that they haven't done with you already, and they don't tell you that, that's a problem, right? Because they're going to steer you in that direction. But if they're honest and have integrity, what they will do is say, hey, before we move forward with this plan or this strategy or this insurance or whatever, I get paid on this because of X, Y, and Z. Now, you don't need to use me. You can use whoever you want. You're more than welcome to. But if you do use me for this, it's a conflict of interest. I'm going to get paid. Are you okay with that? In that sense, it's wonderful. You now have somebody you know that's telling you the truth. And that's what we're looking for all the time. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So th this is kind of um, goes without saying kind of slide what you should expect. Um, yeah. Respect and compassion. You know, they're professional. Obviously, we talked about how to find out if they had a history of good behavior from the uh, broker check. Yes, willingness to answer questions is huge. 
you, when you go into that conversation, please have a list of questions. Please make sure you get the answers you're looking for. If the answers, you're, you're, if you're not getting straightforward answers, that's, a, that's an issue. Unless, of course, they're just telling you answers you don't want to hear. That's a different problem. It's probably your problem more than it is in theirs. Uh, transparency is what we're talking about, what we were just talking about before, right? How they get paid. Are there conflicts of interest? Um, and so to me, one of the most important things about a financial, at least a planner or a professional is, are they interested in you? Are they curious about you, what you're trying to achieve, and your life wishes and life goals? Because, you know, I, 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 Marche and I were talking before about this, and I said, you know, to me, financial planning is a customized approach. Everybody's financial plan is totally unique to them. However, the products and services they receive, everybody that I speak to is financial products and services receive are similar. They're almost identical. Yet the plan is completely unique to them because of this concept. It's your life, it's your dreams. Money flows in and out of things based on what you're trying to achieve. And if the person is really curious about your life, then you know they're on your side and they got your back. And I think that's really important. Okay, uh, so we, yeah, we kind of already touched on this, is please make sure you write down the things that worry you, uh, the things that um, you're happy about and you're proud of, those matter too. Um, you have to have goals in place. Um, yeah, always bring your partner uh, because what you'll discover in a partnership meeting is neither of you see eye to eye on most things and that'll come out really in, in a financial conversation. That's fun to see. Um, but it also gives people the space to learn about each other's dreams and aspirations. And um, you know, remember what I said before, this is really important. A great financial planner pulls out of you pulls out of you the, the, the magic and the gold that is about that what you're trying to achieve in your life. You know, most people show up to one of these conversations, they show up going, well, how much should I put in a 401k? You know, how much money should I be saving every month? But, you know, those are great financial professional questions, but a great financial planner gets deeper than that and goes, no, 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 no. I get that. The, I'm going to solve those easily for you, but what are you really trying to achieve in life? And let's get to work on it. I mean, to me, that's really, uh, be, ready for the, be ready for those kinds of conversations. Okay, so trans, life transitions, this is huge. Um, so I tend to say to people, when you're choosing a financial professional, that's your buddy for life. And the reason is, is you're stuck with this person for a long time if you like them. And so when you're doing your interview, do your best you can because that's important because you are going to go through some wild transitions, whether you <laughs> know it's coming or not. And I've seen them all. And some of them are listed right here, right? Like having a family, getting a divorce, changing careers, buying a house, unexpected life events. Uh, I, said, I said before, uh, as jokingly, like, oh, financial professionals now know, know how to handle pandemics too now. So it's like, we can handle everything and how to, how to uh, move through that, um, that journey. And um, that's really important because every transition requires a new set of advice. And th the financial plan is always, it's a living, breathing thing. It's always changing. And we set, our, we set on one path a life event comes up, we move on to another path. Um, yeah, and so retirement plans, this is huge. So you go from saving, 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 saving in, in an investment account to all of a sudden one day you retire, which is fantastic, and now you have no more money coming in. How do you get the money out of all your savings and live strategically for the rest of your life without running out of money and feeling confident and feeling empowered? That is a that's, we should set up a whole um, webinar for that, Marcia, right? How to do that, that's for sure. And then, uh, yeah, and then the other thing is this thing called Medicare. I mean, how does, that's a complicated subject. The, the rules inside of Medicare, you can't imagine how complicated they get. And um, it, it gets uh, in depth. So we wanna, you wanna know how to deal with those transitions as well. 
And that's it. Uh, is there any questions? We do have some questions here. Uh oh, and here we go. I'll go ahead and get started. I want to tell our attendees if you have a question, go ahead and leave that in the chat. And uh, we'll try to get to them in the time we have today. Uh, here's a question referring back to what you said earlier about fees. So, for example, you talked about that management of assets saying mm -hmm. 1% mm -hmm. and taken out yearly. Uh, is that really taken out yearly or is it done on a like quarterly or by it's quarterly? It's, it's, quarterly. Typically, it's typically quarterly. So it's 1%, right? But not 1% every quarter. It's 1% divided by four. Uh -huh. So it's a quarter of a percent every quarter that comes out. So, and then yeah. where is that drawn from? It, do, are you writing your financial advisor a check? Nope, uh -huh. it's autom typically it's automatic. Um, what happens is uh, every investment account has to have a cash position. So you're never truly 100% invested. Usually there's like, you know, like, one or two percent of the of the money that you've invested is just sitting in a cash and it just comes from that cash account now how does that cash account grow and move and, and sort of the inside of an investment account you'll get dividends you'll collect interest you know they'll be buying and selling of different funds and so th so that kind of what does it over time yeah all right here's another question uh, do you have to meet with a financial planner in your geographic area are there restrictions restrictions like for lawyers based on state licensing? So, well, I've been, I've been meeting everybody via Zoom lately. So I'm meeting everyone across the country via Zoom. Uh, from a, from a uh, investment management perspective and from collecting fees, you have to be licensed in the state the person lives in. So it's a new, you don't have to take a new test. You just have to pay the, the, the professional has to pay like for the that state um and same thing with insurance insurance has to be sold in the state in which you live in uh so you have to do that um yeah that that, that pretty much covers it. but you don't so, have to meet people face to face anymore i mean so i guess the question was like if i want to meet with a financial advisor who's not in my state it's just to clarify the advisor has to be able to advise in that state, but they don't have to live there or have their practice there. Right, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So this is a good one. What if you're moving to a different life stage, for example, retiring and your financial advisor is not a good fit anymore. Maybe they're uh, more of that accumulation period, beginning period, that's what they specialize in. Can you talk a little bit about switching advisors? Yeah, so you may have to do that. Uh, there are professionals that all they think about and deal with is the transition from accumulation to decumulation, right? To pulling money out of accounts every month. If, if, the, if the advisor has no experience in that, that is not good. Now, there's a lot of strategies. Um, member designation, uh, one of them I mentioned before is a retirement income certified professional. There was a great, great uh, designation that discusses um, how to manage pulling money out of accounts over a long period of time. And there's a lot of strategies and techniques and tools that need to be brought into the conversation. It is not the same thing as accumulating. It's a completely different animal. If the professional doesn't understand, then uh, th that's not good. And you know, it's a really important time, right? You're not working. This money has to last 20, 30 years. There's other family members involved. There's insurance like Medicare. There's social security that has to be handled. There is how to not run out of money. There's all new types of products that come into it. like. So it's, it's, now what's interesting about financial, that question is, do I have to fire anyone? No, you don't. You can keep people along for the ride, but now you're actually getting people to, you're, you're, you're changing 
this person used to be the accumulation person. Now they're just going to invest the money. I need someone to manage the retirement themselves. So you're bringing on either a new team leader, right? So new person to manage the whole team, that's possible. And you have a separate business relationship with them. Now, if you don't want to pay extra money, you know, now you're doubling. Now you can get one person to do them all, right? So that is, um, yeah, that's a big thing. Totally. All right. This is a good, this is a good uh, kind of te uh, terminology question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a custodian? Ooh, good question. Yeah. So let's do this in a way that's kind of, um, I'm going to look at this from a complicated perspective because, because if it, what happens is a custodian tends to wear a lot of hats. Now let's talk about who some custodians are and you'll understand what I mean by they wear a lot of hats, right? So some custodians we've heard of, uh, you may have heard of Vanguard, you may have heard of Fidelity, you may have heard of Charles Schwab, you may have heard of TD Ameritrade, right? These, a lot of these institutions are custodians. So let's break down each different aspect of a, of, of a business relationship. So. That we have some we have some individual person who has let's say you know a million dollars of investments okay so the question becomes who's the financial planner who's the investment advisor who's the custodian planner investment advisor custodian okay so the custodian is the institution that has the money Okay, that's where it sits. The buying and selling is done there at the custodian. But a true custodian doesn't have any instruction to do anything. They get the instruction from the investment management team. So the investment management team is a whole different team that's doing research all day long to figure out what the best investments to be in and that, and, and then instructs the custodian to buy and sell things, okay? But then there's a financial planner who not, may not be part of the investment management team. They're investing the investment management team how to allocate the money appropriately for, for the client. And so that's the way you wanna start thinking about these different groups of people. Right now, what happens is when we go to one of the big names that I mentioned before, they do everything under the sun. So it's a one-stop shop, right? They do the investment management, they do the financial planning, they do the custodial work, but they're not all the same. And you know, each group gets paid differently along the way. Everybody's getting paid. That's the other thing. And that, <laughs> that's, that's a good thing to say. Everybody gets paid in the process of money, there is no free lunch. Somewhere money's coming from somewhere. Just be careful of that concept. That's another whole webinar, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this actually, this question was a follow-up to that one. Um, maybe you can clarify just a little bit. So how does an independent advisor work versus an advisor with a big name brand like you had mentioned? Yeah, it's the kind of the same thing. So if I'm an independent advisor, I have no, um, I have no obligation to provide any financial product or service by any other entity. I just go and find what I think is the best, right? As a professional, I would go and find what I think are the best based on a number of criteria, okay? There, what's nice about that is you're just kind of getting somebody that really went out into the world and found the best relationships they can and enjoy the relationships and um you know it's it, it's sort of how they do there's no but there's no pressure there's no pressure from above to force people into any specific direction um now when you work for one company there's pros and cons to that right there what's nice is um you know everything's done in one place they probably do have a lot of great resources and perks and research and all kinds of wonderful things but there is pressure from the from a sort of it's, it's a it's a weird pressure it's not like 
you know, it's not gun to the head kind of thing, but like there's this obligation to sort of steer people into their products and services only. That doesn't mean the products and services are bad. It's just the direction at which the, the, uh, the professional needs to go or wants to go, right? And, and they may be compensated in that direction, right? Again, that comes back to transparency. It's not that it's bad that they have to send you in that direction. You just have to be aware that's the direction they're sending you. So there's only, but again, I mean, we've all heard all the big names, right? And most people go to the big names. I don't know why, but that's what they do, right? It just, there's a way in which they get most people to go in their direction. It's probably marketing and advertising. They have the budgets for those. Individuals don't have those kinds of budgets, but, and it's, it's neither good, neither bad, right? It's not right versus wrong. It's just that understanding how these different worlds are is important. And, and, and the professional needs to explain that to you. All right, I have a couple more questions and we're gonna um, end things here. Uh, so can you go back to a financial professional who is advising, but also sells insurance products? Um, can you <laughs> talk, a little bit, <laughs> talk a little bit about kind of how that maybe should work and any red flags? It's a tough one. So. Um, when they sell it, so there's, okay, so there's nothing wrong with any financial professional license to sell, shell, sell insurance. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But remember what I said before, the, a, a great financial professional is going to send you to other professionals out there, right? And let's use real estate as a great example, right? Nothing against real estate agents. They're, I love them. They're in my family. I, I love them all. But they see the world of investment from the perspective of real estate, whereas real estate is the only most powerful financial product on the planet. There's a lot of power in real estate, but it's not at all times, everywhere, all the time, it's not the best product, right? There are times when it's the best and there's times when it's not, right? And so, so, so the concept is, you know, real estate's not perfect all the time. It's the same thing with insurance, right? an insurance professional that's being sort of, the way in which they get compensated is through the sale of insurance products, starts to see the world as everything is insurance, sometimes if they don't know how to themselves separate it all. So you have to be careful in that, does this person only see finance as insurance products or is it just another uh, piece, of a, a piece of the pie? And if they see, is it just another piece of the pie? And they give advice from other perspectives as well and understand that you can go somewhere else to get the insurance and they're still willing to work with you and give you good sound advice, that's great. But if it seems like the only solution to it is, of, of a financial plan is massive amounts of money going to insurance policy and none other anywhere else, that's where you want to start going, hmm, I don't know about this, All right? Maybe that's not what you're looking for. But there's nothing wrong with your professional providing you with insurance advice and providing the product to you, but just understand that they get compensated like that. So you know, that, I think that's a great way of saying it. Thank you for that answer. And then this is our last one that we have time for. I do wanna say if our attendees have any more questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after the event. All right, this is a great one. All the advisors I've spoken with want to uh, want the asset center management model where they control my assets. Um, how do I find an advisor who will allow me to maintain full control of my accounts and only charge me on an hourly basis? How to find them is the question. Mm -hmm. Well, every financial professional you ask, you ask them, right? Uh, so that's the first thing. Ask the ones, that you, will you let me keep um, have complete control? If the answer is no, then move on. If their answer is yeah, then. now there's actual um, there's actual professional groups that hang their hat on the concept of fee only. So I believe if you Google or do a search for fee only professional, they'll allow that. that, that that's kind of how they do it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's th there's a couple websites for that. Fee only professionals, national association. I think it's a 
fee only financial planners or something is I can't I can't remember it off the top of my head. So there are people that do a blend, a combination of, you know, uh, fee, fee only is the concept this person's talking about. It's called fee only. Uh, but some people do both. They'll do fee only for you, but with other people, they do manage the assets and they'll just for you, they'll do fee only. Um, you can get the same quality service from that person. Um, yeah, so that's, there's, there's, it's very easy to find is, is the answer to the question. There's associations that uh, get together and that's all they do is that kind of plan. Well, I appreciate you for being here. I appreciate the uh, organization that made this webinar possible today. Thank you everyone for your great questions. If you will uh, look to your email soon for a link to the replay of this event, you're welcome to share that replay with friends or family or colleagues. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who is a great fit for your life and your financial questions. All you have to do is go to advicechaser.com and click on the link to find an advisor. Every one of our advisor partners has agreed to offer a free uh, consultation to anyone that we send them to. So that is available to anyone here. We want to thank you for being here and we will see you at another webinar very soon. Bye everyone.